This is about you. The infinite you. The part of you that can't be seen, can't be smelled, touched, or tasted. But you know you feel it. Who you really are. In a world lost to confusion, a universe that's partly illusion, when we look for meaning, we often simply find more delusion. Ground your consciousness in the sounds of the universe, a podcast about your true omnipotence. There's a universe inside each of us, but our beliefs keep us constrained to the edges of what we can imagine. The Innerverse Podcast is your portal to that infinite realm of ideas. I'm Chance Garden, and I'll be your host as we serve up inspirational sound waves from the brightest minds with the highest vibes. And we keep searching for the empowering perspectives we need to create our greatest masterpiece of all, our lives. Welcome to the one within all to the inner verse. I'm your host, Chance, and it's one of the most exciting times in my life right now as I'm preparing not just an amazing show for you to enlighten yourself with, but also a big milestone on my journey in the form of this Backwoods Music Festival shindig that you've probably heard me talking about. I'm extra excited about all this because it has always been my dream to land a festival spot as a workshop or as a vending booth through my podcast. And here we are making it happen. I've been to some smaller events before, but this one's really going to connect me with a lot of the tribe. And I can't wait to see your faces out there. Through the last many weeks, especially if you've followed me on Facebook or YouTube, you've probably seen the multitude of gifted teachers, thinkers, and music makers who I've interviewed about their journey to this great gathering of the vibes. If you're catching this episode in June or later, then we've already gone through this epic pilgrimage to Mulberry Mountain in Arkansas to connect with the tribe and have a great time. But even if you weren't there or aren't going, this talk today is definitely a universally applicable one. As I'm joined one last time by a fellow workshop presenter at Backwoods, this is the grand finale of this kind of mini-series, and I'm really excited about it. Today, we've got the multi-talented chaos magic master known as Michael Murphy. This whimsy wizard has a wily way with wordplay that will awaken your wonder and weaponize your lexicon with upgraded definitions for your manifestation vocabulary. Michael is a newly certified massage therapist and energy healer who's clerking with an awesome group in Fayetteville known as the Human Experience. He's also a live poet, performing dancer, and transcendental joker who's always hearing the great cosmic giggle and transmuting judgment into compassion wherever he goes. But most interestingly to me in today's conversation is the dive we're going to make into the rules of engagement for laughter yoga, a practice that Michael teaches in festival workshops like the one we're both about to attend. The beauty of self-healing, as Michael says, is that it's hilariously simple, and it begins with bringing awareness to the body and the moment you're currently inhabiting. Don't forget you can be an Interverse Plus member just like Michael Murphy is by signing up at patreon.com forward slash Interverse or by using the link in the show notes. And you'll get the next dimension of Interverse exploration each week with a bonus hour interview content, all while supporting the podcast in the best and most reciprocal way possible. Now let's get ourselves into the grounding mindset while also scanning above for that ladder to cosmic energy, sync up our inhale and exhale into silent smoothness and feel that as above so below conduit begin to come online and remind you that you are already the master of your own inner verse and all things internal or external are reflections of yourself. 
Now that we're connected into that perpetual flow of synchronicity, let's combine our astral forces to bring a powerful time-defying love blast of gratitude towards our first-time guest today, Michael Murphy. And if you really want to make him feel the love, go find him on Instagram at SmurphyTheSquizzard. Linked in the show notes and also let him know how awesome he is on social media. Michael, my man, thanks for hanging out with me today in person and welcome to the Interverse. Hi, thank you for having me. Oh, I guess I got to start off with asking you a question. We've just been hanging out for a while. So (laughs) the conversation's flowing so well. I've had to really tamp down that urge that I need to get us on microphones immediately. (laughs) That always is a pesky urge whenever I'm hanging out with anybody since I started podcasting. But Michael, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself a little more? I know that I've introduced you, but those things never do justice to what the person is able to say about themselves. Well, my name is Michael Murphy. I I do a lot of things. Identity is still kind of a unpacking question for me, but I I dance, I write poetry. I've recently completed training to be a massage therapist. I grew up in Arkansas, so you get some positional kind of heritage there. Well, one thing that you're introduced to me on was laughter yoga, and this is something that you've brought to different festivals and you'd actually just came off of a festival experience that I'd like to talk about. But first, just so that we can make sure and discuss what is probably going to be in the title of this show, (laughs) what is laughter yoga? How does that work? Is it something that we need some training on? Possibly. It's really simple. So the training would be as short as just knowing the, the basic rules, which the rules of laughter yoga are you don't hold judgment. You make eye contact with other people and you laugh. You know, it's really that simple. I like to call it hilariously simple. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) And the the whole practice, uh, it was originally developed in 1995 by a cardiologist. He did a longitudinal study on the health effects of laughter and came out of this study with findings that laughter is one, really, really good for the body um, and the mind, just healing in general. And two, it can be forced. The placebo effect of laughter is the same effect as genuine laughter. Um, So that developed into this practice of laughter yoga, which is led like a a yoga asana class. Um, There are different types of laugh and different vibrations that you reach in your laughter and different things you work through as you're using the laughter. Um, Just like different asanas move different energies, you use different types of laugh to work through. So it's led and in between kind of sessions of laughter where you'll maybe go through a whole vibrational exercise, like a low ho 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 to a high ha 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 ho ho You're moving those energies. And in between you have kind of grounding moments where you consciously breathe, maybe you feel into shifting energies and you do that in sections and it culminates with one guided grounding, full integrating meditation at the end. Um, so you feel all those energies, you loosen all those energies. And I like to bring it back in my practice, back to heart centered kind of just energetic awareness. So you build all this sacral energy into this like driving solar energy as you're really working to laugh. And it's a workout on your like whole abdominal core. Um, and you build up all those energies. And then in the guide, the guided meditation at the end, you really bring it into the heart space. And that's where the magic happens in my experience. (laughs) Man, it was cracking me up just to even imagine <laughs> all, the the, all thing. the times whenever you just like stare at your friend and tell they crack up. Like you can't, you know, all those staring contests you had where they always end in the hilarity. So that's pretty cool. So there's actual science behind that. There's like, I guess what you call a placebo effect going on, even when you force the laughter. I think that that's just proof more positive that intentions are basically carrying everything that we do into what it is they become and that in science we just will like name something this this or that effect and then write it off like okay that's what that is we know what that is but it never actually explains how that's happening or why that's happening we've just identified that there's an effect there and so we move on because in materialism it's basically un unknowable it's an unknowable integer so what, you know, what, what about that placebo effect? Have you observed in people who were like, have you seen people that came up like stiff and really not very in the funny zone, like really transform? Like, can you talk about what you've witnessed as you've brought this practice to others? 
As far as what I've personally witnessed, I haven't seen a ton of that transformation, but I know it's happening because the stories come to me. So at the end of a session, well, at the beginning of a session, I go into it and I'm mostly focused on what I'm about to offer. I'll be connecting with people, but I'm really kind of internal dropped into where I'm about to go and where I'm about to take people. But when the session's over, people come up and I can see that there's like a lightness to them almost. And it's always when they're getting ready to come and share something. And they come in and they tell me, I've been told, uh, I've had stories shared with me about childhood traumas being worked through during like, particular laughter exercises. People come to me with what, with their experience. So that transformation, I guess, is just kind of shown to me it's all an internal process and i imagine actually though when i had this picture of, in my mind of a frowny faced guy grumpy arms crossed like he's not coming to laughter yoga anyway probably <laughs> no not that we don't love this person grumpy from the seven dwarfs but a lot of our connection with the tribe is coming through things like festivals yoga events mm -hmm. and then what you're experiencing and some people that are probably already more open anyway and they're doing the internal work themselves, like you're talking about having to drop into for to be able to even present this. So then maybe that wasn't exactly in the retrospect, the, a question that <laughs> like that there's a transformation right there in front of you. You don't have to see that in the external to know that something is really shifting. I think a good evidence of that is also sound healing, which you mm. and I have both had recent experiences with and is probably a lot. There's probably a lot of similarities to the modalities in, the, in terms of what they're achieving for the person. Yeah. Um, well, as soon as you said that and kind of went back and reanalyzed your question, actual examples came to me. So there was one chant, uh, one example at a flux, um, a little festival in Arkansas, less than 600 people typically, and like 60 people showed up to my laughter yoga session. So it was like 10% of the festival was there. And I do remember at the start, people were like kind of awkwardly standing in a circle and kind of waiting, like what's about to happen. Nobody there had done laughter yoga except for the people who were at the festival that I did like a few weeks before. So this was a new experience for almost everybody. And afterwards, it was very clearly different. The energy was not isolated. People had formed into groups. And in laughter yoga exercises, sometimes there are small groups that formed. And I noticed that those people, as soon as the big group meditation was over, People collapse back mostly into those small groups that was happened in the laughter yoga session. And that involves non-judgmental non touch, like hugging. Um, there's a, a laughter exercise called um, the heart-based laugh. And you literally heart-to-heart -heart hug and you just kind of giggle together for a while. You really dive into those energies. So once people had gone there in a non-judgmental space, those connections were made. So they never had to exchange words, but they immediately went and tried to fill in those words or whatever. The, those relationships were already created and that was really obvious and apparent in that session and it happens in most sessions where people are talking to each other afterwards it really breaks the ice and not only that it opens the heart so you have real beautiful connections that are happening as people are walking away from the session in different groups than what they arrived or maybe if they arrived solo they're leaving with friends so there was an answer there <laughs> No, that sounds like kind of what I was picturing that it's almost obvious that if a bunch of people laugh together, they're going to bond, right? Yeah, absolutely. And then the eye contact thing, there's so much to be said about how trippy it can be to actually look close into someone else's eyes for a, like several minutes. Even when we were hanging out at the park earlier, I got like the cosmic Shakti from you telling a story while I was looking at you straight on. I mean, it can really happen like that uh, instantaneously just by opening up those two portals on your skull to the universe that is right in front of you with another human being. So I think it's really cool that you're bringing that type of connection to the world and to the festival family, because then they can take that wisdom out and help others with who might actually be the frowny, grumpy, Scrooge type guy that they run into in their office. And instead of like having that energy rub off on them, they've been strengthened by heart opening exercises such as this one. And then, you know, maybe they can actually break the ice with someone that just wants to be loved, but is afraid. And therefore they're stuck in a non self loving situation that keeps them from even getting close to other people. You know, you know what I mean? Like this can really ripple out into the world, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I call it hilariously simple. 
because it's really like the practice itself is one thing and finding a group to do it with is one thing, but it can be done alone. Um, it can be a self-healing practice. Uh, laughter is coming up in conversations as this like new emerging spiritual path. And I really think there's a lot to be said to that. Uh, it's a deep form of awareness and healing when you're able to pull things into your awareness and laugh at them. It takes a lot of confidence, takes a lot of understanding. Um, of course, it can be done at like a low vibrational level, but you can also really get into that with the laughter. It's a, it's a pranayama in itself too. So it is moving those energies. It is doing the healing and it's changing you. Um, and I, I feel like if it's done non-judgmentally, it's always changing you for the better. It's making you lighter. I was just thinking about times in my past where I had like the most intense, maybe psychedelic journey type experience where it's all just coming crumbling down. Like, I know I'm dead. It's over. <laughs> you know, it's the worst. The, the cosmic joke. Exactly. And then it comes <laughs> back around. And there's that moment where something pops and then all of a sudden you get it and you're laughing. You're like, oh, this is what life's about. And, I, you know, it's hard to even describe that cycle outside of the psychedelic experience for the person that doesn't maybe have that. But essentially, a lot of us come to this realization, I think, where you're like, oh, everything's actually a joke. <laughs> Alan Watts quote, like greatest of all time, possibly mankind suffers because he takes seriously what the gods created for fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so that ties into two things that have come up um, since we've been talking, especially about laughter yoga. One, the, the most difficult people that I encounter in laughter yoga sessions are the jokesters, are the ones who want to be the source of the laughter. They have that desire because it disarms them in a way. Like that's one of their tools for social interaction. And when you walk into a laughter yoga social, everyone circle, everyone is laughing and it's all non-judgmental. There's no reason. There's no joke. You're just laughing for the sake of laughing. So when you take away the joke element, a lot of people, well, not a lot of people, but I've seen those like those jokester archetypes. They will double down on their jokes and they'll try to like step forward and it just doesn't work in a laughter yoga <laughs> because everyone's already laughing. Like, <laughs> and it's funny to see that process unfold. Um, it's, it's funny. <laughs> so now we are almost broached an entire topic that I never even had awareness of, which is that there's more than one reason to laugh and <laughs> you can just laugh out of like pure happiness. Mm -hmm. People sometimes laugh in panic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and it's and maybe that joker archetype is sort of a not every person that's the jokester because i mean who doesn't love to crack a good joke and make their friends laugh that's okay but sometimes the element of the root of a joke is like making fun of somebody or tearing something down or casting judgment and it might be funny because there's truth in there but it's not always like the most unifying type of humor i guess so i could see where that type of um that type of comedian would maybe even get frustrated at not being able to keep up that role temporarily. And then hopefully they also notice as it goes that it's okay. They don't have to always be the one making everyone laugh and they can just like enjoy it too. And like relax even for a second. Yeah. I actually make a conscious effort if I see those archetypes show up and I see that struggle. I've done this twice now in the sessions that I've been aware of where I will bring up a, a an exercise of laugh at yourself. And so they kind of have that satisfied <laughs> in a weird way. And that's what it is, is it's just like the session is tuning in with everybody there and working with the group's energies, what's presented to work through together with the laughter energy and talking about the different types of laughter. That's exactly how it falls into this spiritual path. Because if you're just laughing for the sake of laughter, laughter is a transmutation. And it takes whatever energy you feed into it and transmutes it into joy. The pranayama activates the sacral chakra and the solar plexus chakra and literally fires that energy into joy and right up through the energetic chain. So if you are laughing without judgment and you truly hold that blissful, joyful laugh, that is a spiritual enlightenment in a way. You see everything as it is and you're allowed to just kind of experience that bliss. And then that connects because the lower chakras are connected to the upper chakras. Now, all of a sudden, of course, the upper chakra reflection is that the laughter is coming out of your throat chakra. Mm -hmm. Yes. But then your third eye is actually now, which is not uh, your third eye is not like your regular eyes. It's actually a projector. Mm -hmm. It goes the other direction of your eyes. It's like projecting out everything that you're perceiving <laughs> mm -hmm. in a sense. So you're turning the projector into um, 
something that's generating more of what it is that brings you authentic joy and bliss and laughter out into the entire omniverse just through you know that connection to the sacral creative force that's on the lower side of the spectrum and i think also maybe it would be pretty hard well actually okay to like go back to that dichotomy of the two types of laughter i guess one is the heart where you're bypassing the heart on it mm, exactly and, exactly that is totally 100 percent what's happening or if you have judgmental laughter, there's no heart operation. There's no, you're jumping straight to the third eye and creating like jokes get pretty dark and scary pretty quickly. Like when you think about it and that's why laughter yoga originally was telling jokes in a circle and they realized that the jokes were hurting people. Um, they would become sexual. They would become uh, racist. They would become something that was actively demoralizing or diminishing another group of people. And so he went back to his study, Dr. Kataria, the creator, he went back to his study and realized that they could just force laughter because the placebo effect worked just as well. And so he modified the practice and made it just laughter exercises. And then it, it became successful like with its original healing goal. This is really giving me some introspection. You've uh, like, this is one of those episodes where I'm like, Oh man, I'm going to change after this conversation. <laughs> I mean it though, because I, I'm going to have no, with this new awareness, I'm never going to be able to make the joke that's, uh, even at someone's expense that's not around without going, well, that was the heart, heartless type of laughter. <laughs> and maybe I could just find the good kind of laughter. Again, there's, I think there's still room for such a thing as jokes, but, uh, it, it's all, I guess, in context and, and in intent, right? And like, I, what do you feel about like uh, uh, having sort of deprecating humor, but not not viciously deprecating, just like, you know, c not calling someone out for something that they're sensitive about that is going to hurt them, but just laughing at our f our flaws and faults doesn't necessarily lock in the uh, the judgment program, right? Yes. And the answer to this question takes me back to a, a different story. At Beloved Music Festival last year, I attended a, a workshop on what is magic. And the whole workshop, I cannot remember the presenter's name, and it has bothered me for a while now that I haven't been able to find it. But he talked about how he believes magic to be when things align so perfectly, you can't help but laugh. So there is space for jokes, I feel, but it's when it's, you're not forcing it. It's just, kind of comes out you out of you in that moment you have the perfect words and everybody laughs together and you feel that heart connection together when you feel that and it feels right then that was spirit making a joke through you but when you make that joke and you're like ooh, or somebody goes ooh, and then you laugh anyway that's laughing because you just injected a trauma into that sphere into that circle and you're laughing to heal it immediately so there's a difference where if you never have that kind of question and it comes through, then yeah, there's genuine jokes, there's genuine laughter. And it's always like really kind of light and playful, I feel. Like it's just like so perfect, you're so silly. It's just, ha ha ha, you can't help. Man, that's deep. <laughs> this, <laughs> yeah. is, this is really deep stuff. It goes back to that thing that we got on, we we're talking off air, that the line between the sage and the psychopath is like paper thin because both have the same toolkit. And it's just like, a crazy amount of awareness but then whether or not the empathy is online basically yeah the guy sitting on the corner laughing maniacally is he laughing at something that's not there is he healing the world Who knows? <laughs> i like how you say that spirit comes through you to make the joke and then there's that heart connection in the space and you feel it and no one feels bad about it and then you know i mean we don't really have to go around qualifying whether or not our jokes are going to be good or bad we just got to pay attention to ourselves, and if we catch ourselves, be honest about it. And if we feel good, then don't even think twice about it, right? I mean, yeah. the, that's sort of where it's at. It's just really cool to be able to bring this level of awareness to something as basic and every day is laughter and jokes that I guarantee we've all taken for granted. I mean, I've never thought this deeply about something that's an integral part of my life. Even going back to elementary school, I remember one of my favorite teachers telling me that there was some like statistic or science that proved that you needed to laugh at least eight and a half times a day and that itself always made me laugh because i was like how do you have a half laugh <laughs> so i always get one out of it if i remembered <laughs> that's beautiful in dr Kataria's study he came out and says that 15 minutes of sustained laughter a day is optimal health 
Wow. So laughter yoga is not a healing practice in itself. It's actually a supplement. Um, so in healthy community, in ideal lifestyle, whatever that may be, the form of humanity, we're laughing for 15 minutes straight every day. Wow. Yeah. And I feel like I have a good sense of humor and I laugh a lot, but sustained laughter where you're just like busting a rib, laughing so hard so much. That is sadly rare, even for me. And what do we do? I mean, you can answer this question, Michael, and maybe riff on it. But like, what do we do as a society to actually go and tap into that laughter? And what does that do to us as far as uh, the lack of, con- you know, not having our tribe to bring us the laughter? What's the what is the remedy that is brought to us by the corporations? I think we all know. Wait, are you trying to like feed into entertainments? Yeah. Being like forced laughter out of you. But that's like a traumatic laughter. That's a judgmental laughter. Any kind That's of, what I mean. Yeah, like, yeah, corporate. we're we're replacing the real thing with like these sitcom type yeah. of laughter. And it's it's layering on traumas that you're laughing through to basically keep your head above water. But if you actually get into those genuine types of real spirit laughs, then it comes through pretty naturally. I think stand-up comics are able to do this uh, yeah. and they have both things going on. <laughs> Most stand-up comics are really cutting something up pretty bad to cause that laughter. Uh, but I think there are, I think there is the possibility of someone to just be like able to channel the spirit into the space and make everyone laugh a lot. Like what you would consider stand-up, but without all the, not that like, I'm not against crude humor i'm gonna get but i do not like the whole aspect of trauma that you're talking about injecting in and so anyway i bring up the whole entertainment thing just because this is the netflix generation and that's where most people's laughter is coming from is watching somebody on a screen and not even actually on an electromagnetic level you're not even connected to the real person you're connected to a device for it surrogate well on that level the so as this ties back into the idea of laughter being a spiritual path. So laughter can be used in all of those moments where if, say, Game of Thrones has been on my mind. Recently, a few people in my sphere have mentioned that Game of Thrones is audiovisual poison. Like it's violence and there's not a whole lot of like higher level activity going on there. Um, and so when I watch Game of Thrones and I see something that comes up like, I kind of laugh at the violence sometimes. And so that's something in me that is reacting. And I'm playing out this old story of like laughing off this violent oppression that I'm sure is gene- like genealogically encoded in me. Um, and I, if I become aware of that, of why I'm laughing, then that's the spiritual work happening. So every time something comes up that triggers that automa- like automatic reaction for you to laugh, read into it. Why did I laugh? What was actually funny there? Nothing was funny. So what was I doing? And if you start unpacking and kind of following where the joke came from, then you'll realize that it's not a joke. It's almost entirely trauma related. And sharing jokes in circles for cheap laughs is you trying to work through it in with other people or through other people. Totally makes sense. You're just like bringing up in a veiled way your own trauma because you know on an unconscious level it needs attention and your unconscious knows that your conscious mind is basically ignoring this trauma and not actively putting attention towards it to heal it so it's like okay i'll disguise it in the form of a joke (laughs) that then we can all look at it but it's still not as effective as if you own up to be like this is the trauma this is my trauma that i'm looking at as opposed to the you know projection of it onto another being or onto a group or or whatever. And then another element of this, when we're talking about the entertainment that most people are drawn to is that I brought up the whole crudeness thing, but when you look at it on a chakra level, the fact that most of the, most of the jokes on like Bob's burgers are related to poop or farts. And like, literally that is the number one type of joke that's being made. You're actually on the energy spectrum level that's like below the root and it doesn't make it bad or evil. It's just, it's just staying at a certain vibration and, and staying there in a loop. You know, it's not good. It's not the full spectrum of, <laughs> of the humanity experience by any means to be taking in that type of, uh, entrainment. I mean, entertainment. <laughs> mm-hmm. With any type of laughter, any type of joke, I think it really just comes down to the mindfulness aspect is if you're being mindfulness with everything that's happening in your body, all of the things that you are doing, you can, you know, really do the healing and work yourself back to some kind of source level and then build up from there. 
So laughter, all of it is just kind of uncoding those pieces of yourself that, yeah, maybe you're not ready to talk about. Maybe, maybe it's too easy to talk about, or it's like so easy to talk about. Why not? But it's, you're not focusing on something else maybe that is a bigger, more difficult energy blockage to clear. So you have mindfulness, like you just said, and that applies to if you do find yourself deciding that you want to watch something that's like, I guess, low vibrational humor. <laughs> I'm not going to pretend that I haven't watched some TV show in recent history that wasn't exactly what you call woke. I mean, this is something we all have at our fingertips at all times. And sometimes actually you do want to just like chill out and ground and like experience something that is more or less not anything better than a, a mild hypnosis. And it's kind of something Zane brought up whenever I was talking to him about video games. One of the previous guests on the show, Zane Daniel, was that whatever it is that you're drawn to, whatever is your authentic bliss or whatever you feel like would be fun right now, just do that and but bring awareness to it. And then you'll see why, what it is that you were meant to learn out of it. So even something as simple as like, for that example, an episode of Bob's Burgers, you might gain some insight about the mindset of the collective. You might gain some insight about why you do or don't react a certain way towards certain things. And in general, it's not like, it's not like there's nothing of value there, I guess is what I want to say. I, I don't want to be like this prudish uh, <laughs> Luddite type person, because I think it's all there for a reason. We're attracted to what we're attracted to for a reason. And we can have fun with anything. We can bring consciousness and awareness to anything. It's just a matter of if like, well, if the enjoyment is because something's being victimized, then that's not really ideal towards our growth because ultimately all is self. So what is being victimized is always self whenever you in the conversation, I guess. Absolutely. And there's like a short story that I have that kind of goes along with all this. So when I first started unpacking the laughter as like kind of this energetic tool, the energetics of laughter, if you will, that's kind of what I packaged this whole conversation as. Um, I immediately did what is typical in awakenings and I went full throttle all into like 100% into this like non-judgmental laughter and I did not make jokes anymore and I didn't even have space for jokes anymore. Um, they were kind of triggering for me and I did that for, for months. And then one, like, and I have a history of being an internet troll. Like that's just kind of how I grew up through all kinds of things, especially in social media. I just like to crack jokes and when I see them and I stopped that behavior, I cut that out entirely. And it was like the one time I let it come back in, it like, I was like, okay, I think I'm ready to like reintegrate this. I can make a joke. It ended up without my knowledge being really triggering to the person that I was making the joke with, like in a comment on Facebook and it ended up being this huge ordeal. And then it kind of just came back around, like, don't need to be all against it, but at the same time, just be really conscious when you do let it slip, <laughs> like really bring it in. Oh man, this is not something I want to talk about just for at length about the topic itself, because I think it's been brought up to the collective on purpose right now to create division at an important time of what could be what you would call planetary ascension. <laughs> but the fact is, all of us are aware that there's this uh, crazy war going on amongst our very brothers and sisters and friends and family over the fact that certain states have uh, decided to anger half the people by saying that some people can't get abortions in those states, right? Yeah. Now, basically, from a place of non-judgment, you have to realize that everything is case by case and there's no blanket solution for all human beings. And just because uh, you feel super strongly about it being one way all the time and the other person around you thinks the opposite of you doesn't mean you get to like go slam dunk on their social media post or in some way try to win the point on them because the, it, the jokes are also a lot of the time a way of trying to win a point, which is that like, you're wrong or you're foolish or you're ridiculous when it comes to the internet trolling thing that you're mm -hmm. talking about. And a lot of, uh, a lot of our tribe still wants to like get in there and show someone why they're wrong. And I mean, I'm guilty about this too. I've had to more or less just, I've basically just refrained from addressing comments on my social media posts. Now, if they're in some way looking to combat me, 
And it's not that I'm not open to what they said. I read it, but uh, I'm not going to then reply and be like, well, I respectfully still hold the point that I made in this original post. My original post makes the point that I want to make. I, I don't really need to add to it. But then I see it makes me almost want to just refrain from even making a post that has some kind of statement that not everyone's going to agree with because then in my comments, I have my own friends uh, fighting with each other over what is correct about it. So it's like this really weird thing where I was trying to make a point about why we should not be dividing ourselves. And then someone else comes in with uh, mad division programming and then someone else who wants to be the, the good guy and like stop the troll, fight the troll, but they're still in the division programming by just even fighting the troll. So I'm like, man, maybe I just got to totally quit Facebook altogether, <laughs> but it's all over the place. It's not every social media, especially this new particular issue that is obviously packaged just to create the division while, you know, more nefarious things go on in the background. Yeah, that's a greater effect of just the polarizing of communication that we have going on in the world. Um, and my, I guess, stance, I, I don't want to say the word reaction came up, but it's not a reaction. It is my action. And like in view of that is to just be ever more conscious of everything that I say, do, produce, create. And I think with the intention of always moving to that be more conscious and just kind of keep developing that it's really helping that whole issue in this happens in the macro sphere, like just completely dissolve because I had those issues too. But as soon as I dropped that idea of like, I, I don't really use social media so much to get my idea out there anymore. It's more just kind of where I'm at and it's almost like a, like a diary in a way, um, what was going on in that moment. And by internalizing those conversations and just taking it away from any point where someone could latch in with that division, I think that brings in unity because the people are going to read it and they're either going to like identify it and have some kind of quick affirmation or they don't have anything to say at all about it. And that's, I guess, one way that I see the platform is not entirely in that division model. So like, don't run away from it entirely. You can shift it. But if you're trying to put out information, it's not a great place to do that because it's designed to uh to crumble any argument by creating that division yeah it's it's weapons grade military technology facebook is actually developed by darpa you can even go find all that out kind of think more and more as I, I ever reflect on this that it's since i can't turn comments off on my posts <laughs> i know that there are occasionally things that i'm i might say or that might actually get someone to who is open-minded to go oh that's what's happening and fix some confusion that they had in their mind about like, why is everyone fighting about this? And I, I want to be the person that can make the statement that others are helped out by because I've had others do the same thing. I read something they, they wrote and now I get something more deeply and I could really help me out to read that in that moment. Mm -hmm. It was really ideal for today. But then a lot of the, a lot of those people like myself included, whenever I read it, I'll just like hit like and move on. I don't even make the comment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, it's it's an interesting conundrum, I guess, overall. I like the idea of not even leaving room for the uh, division to come in. Like posting a podcast is kind of similar because you're not really encompassing the whole idea of what the conversation was just in the audio file. They have to hit play on it first and they probably won't get, I don't know. Luckily, Interverse doesn't attract trolls. That's kind of a cool thing. Yeah, It's just whenever I post about something that is on the public consciousness that's polarized and I try to even bring some unity to it, there will still be those that really don't like it. Or especially whenever I make any statements about factual statements about statism, some people will really come in and be like, we need a government, yada, yada, yada. And uh, I don't know if I'm really helping the fight for human freedom by talking about spiritual anarchy uh, in a realm like Facebook where very few people even know that it means something other than chaos. So <laughs> yeah. it's a tricky thing, tricky conundrum that social media. I don't like the combative phrase, but pick your battles this is ringing out right now. <laughs> no, you're right. And also what, where is my energy really going whenever exactly. I decide to go like write that, write up that three paragraphs about this or that I could have just not been on Facebook at all. And I just use it as the container for, my real creations, my real art. 
Because a lot of times I'll even be like, damn, this is just going down the memory hole. Whenever I write something good, the the space itself actually just discards what you've done in a way because you can't go easily access your posts in an organized way on Facebook. I think really the more every time I reflect on this, I'm just like, I need to not use it very much at all. <laughs> that would be the answer. Yeah. And I, I use it, like I said, I try to use it as an archival tool just from the thing because I can go through my own posts, but as far as the conversations that happen and things, it is kind of muddied. But if you want to go down the, the internet culture rabbit hole, like this is something I learned a long time ago. Like I, in a way, grew up on 4chan. And if you're unfamiliar with it, it's the hive of scum and villainy of the internet. And, uh, there's a lot of really intense things that, go th- like go through those pages but w- after it hits page 10 it's gone it's deleted it's gone forever so there's that's kind of the intensity of like the content gets really really intense because there's a knowing that it's going to be gone and even after internet tracking started like in the i i don't know the exact time i'm probably it's earlier than i ever assume i'm sure <laughs> but um that knowledge of creating content with it being gone created kind of like my voice, I guess, on the internet, which comes off as almost trolley. But if you go into it with, I don't even know where I'm trailing off. this. <laughs> no, this is good. We're, we're actually moving into like the global brain part yeah, of the conversation yeah, yeah. that you wanted to bring up. So, because that is what the internet is like all technology. It's this reflection of our spiritual capacities that's been externalized. And then Many of us have been convinced that that's the only way that that c- capability exists. But actually, it's like everything that the corporations sell to us. It's something that was taken from us in uh, in a stealth way <laughs> or from our ancestors, I guess, more or less, and then repackaged and sold to us in a lesser degree. But that doesn't mean that we can't actually activate this new sphere using the social media that we've got. It's just about getting more conscious about it, right? Absolutely. And so the, the global brain idea is something that my even interaction and understanding and relationship to has changed since I exchanged that first email with you. Um, and some of it was conversations I've heard on your podcast since I discovered you, I've been listening. And some of the conversations you've had have kind of integrated back into that idea that I worked on in college. So I've been a part, I wrote, I started researching and writing about seven years ago on the global brain theory, which is just the consciousness of earth will come come to fruition as a network of technologies um internet of things internet um all those global communication technologies coming together to create one single brain when in reality we have that in multiple forms already in in on this planet and there are sure, surely other ways and other connections that we're not even fully aware of that already serve that purpose but this one is emerging this one's happening and we're able to see it record it and you know play with it as it's coming into life it is in a state of creation and the way i've changed that so the global brain is that idea that it's you have like organelles on the planet that feed into this brain um organs and organelles so you have like power stations that are like the digestive system and you have transportation networks that are like the circulatory system um that is very industrialized and framed understanding of our world yeah it is very corporatized but at the same way when i was in college this is how i was operating and i to link in technology to the gaia hypothesis which i knew is to be a higher truth that was like the greatest idea for me it was this breakthrough and it's not until recently that i've come back to reintegrate some of these technology like understanding of technologies um and my new awareness of it now is like it goes so much further than just a global brain. It goes so much further than just a tech, like technology linking us. We have, um, there are psychic links between humans that are, there's evidence-based and there's so much more anecdotal evidence of things changing, shifting majorly by going outside of a technological connection, like using actual, you know, human geometries and human technologies or spirit technologies or whatever you want to call it. Um, galactic technologies there are so many different sources from it um but i'm still kind of committed to that i'm i have like a nostalgia almost with the global brain idea um seeing it like i grew up i feel like i was raised by the internet in a lot of ways um and this has come through a couple of different points in this conversation but um 
I spent a lot of time playing games and on the internet. And so for me, that was like my, my primary socialization. I had friends, but I had a lot more friends online. And I had social interactions, but I had a lot more social action interactions online. I had accomplishments, but I had a lot more accomplishments online. And so my, my avatar self, which was a Tauren druid, which was a small character with pink hair on Gaia, which was like all these different avatars I've had, I identify strongly with those. And they're like, in a way, they are my spirit guides that walk with me still today. They're parts of me that I've integrated and come to love. And so those ideas and that sense of self live on in this global brain theory. That's how they get to be a full citizen of this like united technology network biological sphere that is the whole organism that is Gaia. Um, not to say that any of the other, like the old ancient technologies that like are being uncovered or uncovered from their suppression or however you want to look at it or the future technologies or just this like pure light activation that can connect, like connect and unite all communications. Like, yes, that's all real. But in my experience, this global brain is like something that really like just sings home to me because it's where I'm from. Like, it makes sense. It's like the unconscious itself, the internet is the collective unconscious being brought up to the surface. And you can only look at the contents of any of the of the unconscious in like your little window, whatever portal you're looking through the screen and your hand or on the desk. But beyond it, there's this infinite water <laughs> of everything, all human data and information all collected in one repository. So in a way, it is like a physical manifestation of the reemergence of the Akashic. And as much as I I do recognize that the spiritual has been plagiarized to create the technology, that's where the masters got it from to give it to us in the first place. Um, it's only it's also occurring because of the fact that we are in a state of evolution and consciousness ourselves. Like the reason why they're even that, that they're giving us the technologies because we are going to be making these connections regardless on the spiritual level or the light level. And it's sort of a, for the few that still want to kind of control the lower forces of the chakra system, trying to rise up into the crown and, and then the fiery side of ourselves trying to put out all the water, you know, the polarization, basically I'm staring at two, two fish, like uh, a, a poster of these two fish that are the duality, the yin yang. But those those things are trying to extinguish each other, the the water and the fire, so to speak. And that comes in the form of technology being used to sort of extinguish our our natural version of the connection or cover it up or supplant it, I guess. And it's funny because it doesn't actually work. All it does is continue the process in that it's a symbol of the process and that the process cannot actually be halted or stopped. And there are no controllers. Nobody is actually in control of everything. There's just the illusion of it and our fear that we aren't the ones controlling our own minds. I mean, that's the real irony of mind control is that if you have perfect mind control of yourself, then you could always do what's best for yourself and never have any problems. And pretty much, I think from, from the original arconic elements of consciousness as it's divided itself down into smaller and smaller mini men till you get to the scale that we're at we have lost a lot in that process because each step on the division was also coming with like chains on it or or blocks on it that kept us from looking up the next level of the octave that we just came from and that's why many of us don't actually even know our ancestors farther back than like grandparents great grandparents maybe a little further than that most of us but we're realizing and connecting the dots that everything that we're experiencing is actually a reflection of the source that <laughs> we can actually get all the way back to the original ancestors which are us and that's part of what it means to like know thyself is that those parts of your your line that have been cut off from you or your family tree that you've lost awareness of that's symbolic of the fact that you don't completely know the full extent of self. So total self-realization is something that I think is coming, whether or not humanity in totality is all going to experience it. I don't know, because I tend to think that we all have our own sort of parallel universes that we're running on. 
But those of us that are merging our timelines back toward like collapsing down our uncertainties into a primary timeline of what it is that we came here to do and know that we want, those of us are actually going to be experiencing the technology be a liberator and a tool that helps us on recognizing what we can reverse engineer to bring into our own field of what we can do ourselves. This is a really long-winded way of getting to to segue into talking about some of like shamanic journeys and how I mean we can use your recent sound healing experiences as an example if you want, but how you are activating the inner technology and you know becoming the animal or the avatar in your inner verse and going on these adventures that are very reminiscent of what is being you're being guided through when you're playing a video game, except now it's self that's generating this thing on a more direct level and without like some external third parties that created the the tracks that you're running on, if that makes sense. And so I think that those avatars that you brought up, I mean, I have them too. And I think that whenever you're really locked in and identifying with them too hard in the moment, it can close down and even colonize your imagination and your thought process and keep you from expanding out of it. But once you integrate those as actually parts of self and you're not... I guess, obsessed with the games as a escapism and things like that, because that was my problem in the past. Then those experiences you went on and those adventures you went on digitally give you actually context for what it might be like to go on a grand adventure internally. Is that making sense? <laughs> oh, absolutely. There's a, a lot of stuff that came up um, directly to the sound healing experience you wanted to talk about. And then also into the more like we had a short conversation before we got on the air about um, blizzard video games and like all the layers of occult that happen in them so it's like those spirit journeys that i went on at, in that avatar space i was actually walking the path of the ancestors because those sim a lot of those symbols are there from a lot of different places so like that was kind of me breaking out of this space and time but yeah you have to kind of allow that universe to exist with all other universes you can't get really locked into it totally and in kind of a more generalized way, it does this conversation and about being attached to those things, those those identities, those kind of habits, the escapism. Um, that all came up in that sound healing journey that we were talking about. So for context, Amy DePriest is a very powerful light worker, sound healer. And in Fayetteville, Arkansas, a few weeks ago, Chance and I both attended one of her sound healings with um, Molly Klinehines, who was also um, one of the presenters and together they created a space of really profound healing within myself. Um, I had a lot of different activations come up. It was wild, the visualizations that I had. So as she introduced different elements, they showed up and they stayed, which is pretty typical for me in my guided meditations. So she introduced uh, a transmutation, uh, the violet flame of transmutation, and she introduced um, kind of like energetic barriers around the space and in multiple layers. Um, and so those all came up. And then as soon as the sound started, she uses crystal bowls. Um, as soon as they started ringing and playing off of each other, I had um, a, a Merkaba made of like kind of a bluish purplish light come out of my heart space and it rested above me. And while listening to one of your podcasts in the recent weeks, you mentioned something about if the Merkaba comes out of you it shows an imbalance or you, something was mentioned along that and that blew my mind We're like oh so it wasn't in the center because it was something was sending it off well uh to actually what i mean by that maybe if this is something i said was that in past experiences the ancestors have externalized the merkaba but with technology so this is actually going back to the technology mm -hmm. thing creating uh, a technological merkaba so I think maybe if it's coming slightly out of you, maybe like maybe if you can interpret that as that it's trying to show you an imbalance, then definitely go with that because spirit's giving you that well, context for a reason. Yeah, but the way I interpret it. So that aside, the way I interpreted the Merkaba coming out of me was actually like the way I was laying and where the sound was going most, it went up into the like the direct path, the vibration. I just want to also say before you continue the story that I also saw the purple light uh, come out and that was... a. I didn't go on a lot of journeys in that because I was working in the body very directly uh, doing like body scanning during the whole thing. Mm -hmm. But bef like in the beginning, when the space was being set up and the first vibrations were being created, I did see this violet 
really bright light with eyes closed that was just like I basically went into it and everything became purple. Mm, <laughs> it was wow. pretty cool. You were transmuting the entirety of self. So what I was doing, uh, I guess my process was as the sound came out, it created these like white tendrils of light, like kind of similar to the way seraphim wings are described. I see a lot of seraphim imagery, angelic imagery in my meditations. And they came out of the singing bowls and were reaching all parts of the room, but they started to get concentrated in my experience towards my Merkaba as it was spinning. And it would catch that. And from being this kind of white, pure light, it would laser into a really, really tight, concentrated beam of like, it, it, where it gets so bright and so light that it's no longer like color. You can't even call it white anymore. It's like prismatic. And that kind of turned into almost like star stuff and created its own galaxy into the into the flame. The flame was the center of the room and that created this energetic spiral of energy coming from those sound bowls and literally like moving through me and, and raising vibration out of my Merkaba. But that energy was also passing through. It was totally clearing out the space. So it was that was beautiful in itself to like behold. And that was just the first like minute. <laughs> and from there, it just really took off. Um, Angel started showing up a lot of my spiritual guides showed up. I'm very, very tied to Vishnu after visiting temples like Angkor Wat and other temples originally dedicated to Vishnu in Cambodia last year. I've had been walking quite closely with him. And other like all of my spirit guides from all along the way, Buddha, Jesus, like all of them showed up in some capacity in this space watching this energy go through. And it wasn't so much like they were guiding me. They were just like there with me. And the only one that wasn't there with me, it was funny. And I like, as I was coming out of the meditation, I was like, I didn't see Hanuman. That was weird. And then I looked down and I was wearing Hanuman on my shirt. <laughs> but anyway, um, so yeah, so they all show up and then they kind of also spiraled through the Merkaba into the light and into the flame. So then they left and then it was just me. And from there, um, some more light beings came up, but they were uh, like galactic beings. They were higher vibration light beings and they came up very quickly and it was one i recognized as being pleiadian just like the shape the structure of the it's like a pleiadian angel um in my my google research that i did after that it was a seventh dimensional pleiadian angel um and that being and another one who i've kind of identified since being a hathor light being both showed up incredibly tall very very tall like looming over me almost if like I was before a council and each one of them had fractaling energy out behind them. Like there was a full council of consciousness behind them. Like this was a very, very open consciousness. And they showed up to me in almost in a, a state of judgment. It felt at first just because of their sheer size and how quickly it came up. And my awareness shrunk down from my laying body with a Merkaba, Merkaba above it shrank down into like the, the embryonic like an embryonic lizard essentially like a really tiny lizard and there the imagery is in one of chris dyer's pieces that i have and it's like the i can't remember what it's called like the conscious high peak of man or something and it's like this big galactic dude and at the bottom is a little like draconic lizard um little lizard anunnaki or some kind of lizard reptilian being and that was me i got shrunk down to that in light of these enormous light beings and from there, it just started this light show went crazy and they were shooting laser beams at the, the lizard me and like to integrate and work through it. It was, I've just recently started to really open up my awareness to star beings and galactic origins and star nations and all these different things. And a lot of different of those, of those ideas have stuck in different ways. And I've almost caught myself like, oh, I'm really focused on that. Or, oh, I'm really focused on this. Or I strongly identify with that. And that whole activation was just kind of like chill. Like no matter what you think you are, or what you, you're you still going through this light. Like this is still the process and, and you're cleansing and you're, you're healing through things. And it was like what I perceived as judgment really quickly became love. And it was just I was being filled with love. And as soon as I got that like download from being lasered by these like crazy star beings, um, the little lizard 
kind of like disappeared and it returned to my heart Merkaba space. So it was like, I allowed this space of like, oh, I'm being drawn into the stars. And my interpretation of it was like, what is my star origin? And through some research, it's like, oh, I might have this like reptilian background in like my bloodline and stuff. And I'm like, oh, I have this life purpose of I have to cleanse this and da, 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 da. And it got really heavy really quickly. And then it just kind of came out like, no, you're just, we're all the same thing. We're all working through this, just work through it. And remember to just like keep your eyes on the light or keep your eyes on the transmutational process. And I came back and uh, there was a lot more that happened on in that. That was like the most, that was the peak of the intensity, I'd say. And things continued to just go very galactic. Amy's style of singing and crystal healing, crystal ball healing is very galactic. And it culminated in this kind of big transmutational awakening. And then Molly took over and her approach is very earth-based, um, very grounded. And they'd even talked about how like their different approaches were perfectly, beautifully inversed before they started. And that's how it played out. So because as soon as Molly took over, the sound shifted from like the ringing harmonies of the crystal bowls to drums and bells and things are made of like materials that are really grounding and like kind of like closer to my tether of awareness and life. And my whole visual experience changed immediately to just an old woman joyfully dancing. And every time she'd hit a drum, her feet would hit the ground. And so I just sat there and I danced to spirit dance as this old woman, very, she'd done it so many times before. Like it's just the dance that she did. And she was giving that energy back to earth. So I had all this galactic activation, this huge buildup of energy, building up, building up, building up. And then I was able to just release it all. <laughs> it was great. And I didn't have to move. <laughs> Dude, that was a really good story. <laughs> I was into it big time. And just the fact that like my excitement makes me laugh about things. It, re it reminds me of the beginning of the conversation about like the difference between the heart laughter or the, the healing laughter. And man, just like that story brought a little bit of laughter to me just to reflect on the totality of it. And my journey was different. And I think that's what's cool about sound healing and about consciousness in, in general is that we don't all have the same exact experience, but then where there are overlaps, we can start to see that, oh, wow, there's something very real here. And anyway, the beginning of the sound healing for me, just to summarize, I was more or less doing body scanning and I felt like I was having light surgery done on my body. <laughs> and at the end of the uh, that part, and we switched over to the the drumming and Molly's part, the more earthy part, that's when I went on like a lower world journey that involved, it was not really like for the purpose of communicating anything. It was more like some of the animal energies, or I didn't even like the word animal because of the etymology of it being bad spirit, but some of the creatures that were not human that are earth, earth type creatures that just kind of wanted me to go play with them in the space of the, the interverse space of the lower world, you know, going through forests and going through those type of things that are so easily accessed whenever you've got that shamanic drum and rattle, which I'm sure you are pretty aware of. And that's a really transformative thing for me to have discovered early in life was that with simple tools like the drum and rattle, even someone playing it on a recording for you, you can sort of hit that binaural frequency that take, lets you get into hypnagogic state and mm -hmm. visualize an entire inner world journey. And I was kind of even thinking about that a little bit whenever I brought up the whole digital avatar connecting to our internal avatar, I guess, for lack of better words, because I like to take cat-like forms in those spaces. I think you do too. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> totally. just all around though, at the end of the sound healing to like wrap up my experience on it, I actually felt as if I had gotten a massage. My whole body felt that sort of, not like sore or achy in a bad way, but just like steamrolled like i've been run over by a steamroller for lack of better words and i needed the extra water and i needed some sleep and so there's definitely powerful vibrational medicine happening there and i could probably never talk enough about how enthusiastic i am now about sound healing because that was my first time in one that was longer than i don't know 30 minutes it was actually two hours and that allows for so much more to pass through the space whenever there's no real it's not really restricted like that by two hours you feel 
good about it being over as opposed to like you kind of wish it still continued whenever it's short. Thanks for being here, Michael. Remind everyone, please remind everyone where they can connect to you on Instagram and and Facebook or if you want to give out an email address or anything like that, like just, you know, do your plugs there, buddy. And closing thoughts if you have any, of course. My name is Michael Murphy. I am a dancer, writer, poet, uh, massage therapist, and energy worker. I like to laugh, um, both in practice and with people, just in everyday life. I feel deeply that I am an arbiter of joy. And I am very grateful to have the opportunity to be on the Interverse podcast. Watching Chance speak is what I would call a spiritual experience at moments. And it's really special to see him getting into his flow and channeling. Um, yeah, just gratitude is all I got. Thank you, man. This you coming in here and saying that to me, it's like... I'm I've been a podcaster for a while, but I've always kept this like arm's length from what I talked about where I'm just presenting someone else's thing. But spirit has been showing me more and more all the time. And what it's always taught me, which is that I actually can teach things. I don't have to be just the host of other people's things. Like it's a synthesis. <laughs> so thanks for, thanks for, uh, asking me that question, and letting me let a rip because maybe other plus members were wanting more context on on what me and Hakan talked about, because that was some pretty heavy duty deep end stuff back on that episode. I did my research and I couldn't, besides what you posted, I could not find anything. So my Google is not your Google and it's obvious on this topic. And that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> oh, geez. Yeah. Oh man. Well, that's how they keep people in the box. Yeah. Oh yeah. I work for Google. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. That is a whole other conversation. Compartmentalization of the human collective consciousness. Thank you, Google. The real Skynet. While everyone's fighting over abortion, they're turning on the Palantir AI system and everything. <laughs> and uh, they're basically putting in like questions of, okay, how do we get this exact outcome on this exact date? And then the machine spits out an answer and says, cause this event here. And it's the butterfly effect in literal sense. And that's what happens with all, we give all our big data away to the, the Google machine without thinking twice about it. And yeah, 2020 is going to be weird. As we see the emergence of the real new sphere kick online from the technological materialism side of things with these strong AIs that are definitely already being exercised and basically being implemented more and more. And then the community of conscious seekers who are ready to go 5D and needing to immediately because we're imminently approaching the 5G reality. So, yeah, and that's a... <laughs> Man, and if I even wanted to, I could break down the esoteric element of the D and the G. Maybe I will do that in the outro. Well, yeah, let's wrap this there, up, Michael. There's an esoteric link between D and G. So I have a form of dyslexia that I only confuse those two letters. What does that mean? <laughs> the D is the divisor, which is the mind and the higher chakras. Uh, D stands for, it's half a circle. So that's the part of your consciousness that divides things and chops them up into bits so that you can understand them. And G is a spiral. G is actually the serpent. It's a snake. Uh, Look at it. It's, it is a spiral too. It's the serpent force. It's the lower energy. Wow. Weird. It goes deep, man. It's all, the language is a code. I'm telling you. <laughs> Constantly. See, I told you I had a lot of questions. I could keep going. <laughs> but thank you <laughs> <laughs> yeah well good thing I'll, we'll just do another one soon this yeah. will be great i'll get you we'll do some live stuff at backwoods that'll be radical yeah yeah that sounds awesome okay so we'll invite some some interesting colorful characters in too <laughs> absolutely uh, we'll bring our mics and it's going to be a blast it's only a few short weeks away all right thanks for being with us everybody thanks for being on plus and love you all talk to you all soon Booyakasha. That's another episode in the archive and quite an excellent one. I love how even though we kind of got hooked up by the fact that we're both attending this event, the episode was definitely timeless, especially this conversation about laughter yoga. There are many gems of wisdom that Michael had uncovered in his own inner work that resonated with me to the level that I'm going to remember this all the time. It's already been coming up in my consciousness while I'm in different moments going through my day. And just having the awareness of it has really helped me shift a lot of the way that I laugh at things to be more heart-based and less judgment-based. Of course, I'm not perfect about it, but 
the less you judge others, the less restrictions you're putting on yourself. And, and we could all use a little bit of letting up on the judgment factor that we have installed in our own minds from that part of our imagination that is constantly generating an artificial intelligence character that is like, this is what society imagines about you. This is what your parents think about you. This is what X, Y, and Z think about you. It's actually what you think about you. <laughs> yeah, that's the trip. So anyway, all around, we can learn a lot by the things we laugh at and what we are maybe bringing to the surface to examine without being consciously aware of it until the unconscious decides, here's a good joke and throws it out for you. Also, I want to say thank you to Michael just for coming over and hanging out with me. That was a big deal. That doesn't happen all the time. And I think all in all, it was actually really good sound quality considering that I was doing it live in the studio and I haven't for a while. It's something that as I've improved my equipment and my experience and know-how, I'm happy to say that maybe I can do more stuff like that live in studio type of conversations because there's a different kind of energy that is maybe more conversational and less interviewee, but that's okay. I like that kind of thing. It felt more like it felt more relaxed, but still deep, man. So all in all, this was a great episode and I'm happy that I got to throw it together in time for being on the road to backwoods, which maybe you are right now if you're one of the Arkansas homies, Southwest Missouri homies, or even coming from far away, maybe you heard about Interverse from some of the promo stuff and you were already planning on going to Backwoods and now you're checking it out. Welcome to the podcast. I hope you go explore the archives and find some things that are tailor-made for your interest and sparking your imagination because there's a lot there. And if you do think you're going to go on the big exploration through the Interverse podcast uh, backlog, then the way to do it is as a plus member because you'll actually be getting over 60, maybe 70 episodes that are double long in the interview content. Usually a two hour interview, at least like an hour and a half, pretty much all the time. So if you want to go into the deep end, as someone recently told me, the free show is like the 3D version and the plus show is like the 5D. So if you really want to go into that dimensional upgrade, like that we're trying to manifest into the reality through our conversations here, then maybe go sign up for plus on patreon.com forward slash interverse. You can find the link to that in the show notes. I'll just give you a quick rundown about some of the things that we talked about in plus the adaptability of sound healing to fit the needs of the individual. Very cool stuff. Michael shared some inspiring synchronicity from the yoga art music festival, also known as yam that he was just coming off of very cool synchronicities actually. And he explained his magical games with this character that he per portrays Smurfy the Squizzard, specifically Dissection Chaotica, which is this amazing magic, chaos magic type of system that he's inventing that involves re-memeing words, amplifying and transmuting them through poetry and this awesome energy exchange that he's set up between himself and other people where both of us walk away with a different and upgraded understanding of what a word means that was clearly important to us because we threw it out there whenever we were asked for a word. And he also did a live reading of a few poems about neutrality and one about a Cherokee word. If you happen to catch that part of the plus extension and you want to go looking that word up, we actually said a doogie, but we found out we had an error in the pronunciation. It's actually gadoogie. And that was a fascinating word all about the gathering of like minds and those that are here to heal the world. So it has a lot to do with the festival we're about to go to and the festival community in general. We also talked about the difference between spiritual time and the circular artificial time of being looped in the rat race. Michael turned the tables and questioned me about the geometry of the cosmic egg model of the universe. So that was pretty fun. I don't actually usually take questions from the guests, but it felt right. <laughs> and I may not have explained it that clearly, honestly. I, I wasn't completely online in the clear zone of consciousness or, or whatever at that point. So in general, I'm actually constantly understanding new things about that entire system and the, the syncretic view of the cosmos that we're in. So if you are curious about some of the things that came up on Cosmic Egg or you don't even know what I'm talking about, I'd really rather you go look it up for yourself if you're curious because you'll find your own inner exp exploration will be amazing. Although, as Michael said, your Google search might not be the same as mine. So if you really do want to get on some of the same info as me, go check out the Hakan Hism link. Uh, links in that episode about three episodes back, I believe, where we went more in depth about that whole thing, the cosmic egg model, very fascinating reintegration of ancient knowledge. And we also talked about becoming the serpent tamer of the Kundalini force, which is a big topic. All in all, though, there was way more than that in the plus extension. I can only say so much about it. I had a great time with Michael. It was a lot of fun. And I 
think there are some things I could clarify and maybe go in depth about, but I'm going to save it for later because honestly, what I've got to do right now is prepare for this big journey I'm about to go on. And it's kind of just awesome that I even aligned it to get this episode out in time before that. So hope to see a lot of you there. If not, hope you guys have a great weekend and I'll catch you guys within a week for... Well, I say within a week. We'll see. I may be in some serious post-festival recovery, but there will be, there's a lot more on the Interverse schedule coming up. A lot of interviews. I've, I've already got a few in the bank that just need to be produced. So no worries. There's going to be a lot of content coming your way through the podcast really soon and some very fascinating topics indeed. So thanks for being with me, everybody. And make sure you check out John Teal, who is the music I'm playing in this outro. John, I love to say John Teal. <laughs> I don't know why. It's just really fun to say. But John Teal is a fellow regional homie in the music making scene. He's from Arkansas somewhere. And I happened to catch him at a local show a few weeks back. And he's also performing at this Backwoods Festival. So I had to hit him up and put some of this awesome tunage into the in outro here. So uh, go follow John Teal on SoundCloud if you like what you're hearing. Show some love to both him and Michael on Instagram or SoundCloud or anywhere. And also, don't forget that if you're new to Interverse and wherever you're catching this might not be the best place to see it update regularly, then you should subscribe on SoundCloud, Spotify, YouTube, the iTunes podcast app, any kind of podcast app or podcast catcher that's out there. Basically, anything where you might imagine that you could find podcasts, you'll find Interverse. So please go ahead and like, share, subscribe, follow, do all the stuff you can to help boost the podcast other than the most helpful thing which is sign up for plus or do it all. <laughs> you can even write a review on the iTunes app. That's always cool. I, I like to read those on the air. So, you know, do all the stuff I just said, if it resonates, if it feels right, if not do whatever you want. And I love you very much. Thanks for being with me and remember all is self and that it's all about bar balancing and harmonizing those vibrations on the inside and out. I love you all. Talk to you soon.